Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Bridge Builders of Diversity where we're bridging the gap for our disabled friends and our typical peers. I'm okay. Sherry and this is... I'm Roberta. I'm a special education teacher and Sherry is the mother of a child with Down syndrome yes. who is magnificent, let me just mention. Yes. And we're coming to you via Zoom today yes. with some great information about um, a very common disability, uh, cerebral palsy. Yep, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to ask Roberta some questions about cerebral palsy. Well, first, what is cerebral palsy? Oh, thanks for asking. It's a neurological disorder. It affects the movement centers of your brain, and it's actually a broad spectrum disorder. It can be any, it, with effects, anything from very, very mild, um, just somebody who might, who might have an awkward gait or have uh, like awkward upper body movements to someone who is very severely impacted and has difficulty with activities of daily living. Um, they may even have breathing and speech difficulties um, from the either the very, very weakness or the very, very hypertone muscles. Now, how common is cerebral palsy? Right now, according to the CDC, I couldn't get a firm number, but their 2010 calculation said that approximately every there are three instances of cerebral palsy per 1,000 births in the United States. It makes it a very, very common birth defect, okay. or um, I guess you would call it a birth defect, but it's more of a neurological condition. All right. What what types of cerebral palsy are there? Oh, there are, there's four main types, and they are classified by the region of the body that are affected by the movement disorder. Um, the first and is spastic. It's the most common and it's characterized by very, very intense muscle tone. So in other words, a, a muscle that is um, rigid and, and, and inflexible. Um, it, they, the movements are very, very awkward and jerky. And it's also described by where it affects in the body. So you can have the sp spastic cerebral palsy in a, in a diplegic area, meaning just like your lower extremities, your legs are involved, or it can be hemiplegic, meaning one side, either your left or right side of your body is involved, or you can be quadriplegically involved meaning all four regions of your body, your lower, your upper, and both sides are, are involved, have these stiff um, kind of, they call it tonic muscles that, that are hard to, hard to flex. Um, there's also dyskinetic, which is, involves uncontrollable movements. Um, so you, if you've met people with cerebral palsy, you might've met someone that has dyskinetic cerebral palsy because you'll notice that they're involuntarily like will just shoot out their, an arm or a leg or they'll just suddenly move to one side or the other. The, those are involuntary movements and um, it will it can vary in severity throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month. Um, it, they, some people may start out their day more relaxed and then over the course of the day as they get more tired, they can become more um, just dyskinetic, meaning that they just move involuntarily. Um, then there's a, ataxic uh, cerebral palsy, which is really more affected the balance and motor portions of the movement center of the brain. So they may be able to move more fluidly, but they don't have good balance or post. They have difficulty with their posture. And then there's the mixed bag. This is probably um, probably the, the most common because it, you'll see like um, maybe a hemispheric involvement with a, a dyskinetic um, upper body so that it may affect the, the different regions of the body in multiple ways. Um, the most severe really is one is quadriplegic cerebral palsy where all four um, limbs are involved and you can, it can be layered with 
um, and ataxic, in other words, a, a difficulty with balance and movement. So um, there's a really broad spectrum of effects from cerebral palsy. So no, I, they're probably, I'm gonna say these people are like snowflakes. No two are exactly alike, but they're, they all have similar qualities. In other words, the, a neurological um, deficit in their movement center. Okay. So what type of range of disabilities, because like with Down syndrome, there's high functioning all the way to severe and profound. Is that similar with cerebral palsy? Very, very similar. I mean, anecdotally, I remember when I was in college, I had a friend who never learned to drive and I couldn't figure it out. So one day I just said to her, hey, I'm going to teach you how to drive. And what I found out later, she confessed to me that she had... Um, cerebral palsy, I'm going to say that she more than likely had um, dyskinetic and um, diaplegic because what she, she had a lot of trouble controlling her feet. She could um, walk. She had a kind of awkward gait and she would get tired really easily, but I just chalked that up to her being her. And, um, but so when I was trying to teach her to drive, she was like, I really can't control my feet. I can move them forward and backwards and I can keep myself standing up, but I can't push the pedals. And she, we, we had a couple of hilarious attempts in the parking lot. So that's a, she's a great example of someone who I wouldn't have a, at, at first contact or even I had known her for months, um, it recognized that she had a disability. It wasn't until she she shared with me that she couldn't control her feet because of the, her cerebral palsy. There's and a lot of hidden was, disabilities. A exactly, lot of disabilities. exactly. So um, another thing about it is, especially with people with a toxic cerebral palsy, I wanna keep looking at my notes to make sure I'm saying the right terms. Um, they might look impaired or, or, or drunk or sloppy, or, and, and really what it is, is they, they have a deficit in their, their movement center that makes it difficult for them to balance or, or to maintain their balance as they move. So again, a, like you said, an invisible disability, but you, people might be quick to judge them negatively because, because they look different. Um, so then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the people who are more involved, um, who might have a, a quadriplegic involvement. Um, they, these would be people who require wheelchairs to move. They may require um, assistive communication devices. Um, they may have difficulty with breathing and uh, feeding and swallowing. Again, this is a movement disorder. So all, just think about all of those muscles that you don't think about. Uh, and when you breathe, when you swallow, when you speak, we don't think about all the muscle movements that are involved in those activities, but it is an all movement um, right. activities, speaking, eating, breathing. Um, so these people are very, very involved and are, would require con care and assistance, but this is not an intellectual disability. So um, I'm gonna say this loud for the people in the back. When you see someone with a movement disorder or a speech disorder, please do not assume that they are also cognitively impaired. They know what you're saying to them. Right. And unless they also have a, a, a hearing disability, they can hear you. Um, and as long as English is their native language, they can understand you. And you know what? They understand your tone of voice and, and they recognize how you're speaking to them and whether it's respectful or not. So please remember that a person with a disability is a person first. Right. And someone with quadriplegic cerebral palsy simply has a movement disorder. Right. It, it does not always affect their cognitive abilities. Right. Absolutely. I am and end rant. <laughs> right. Well, I'm just going to add something in there with having a child with Down syndrome. Everybody Absolutely. believes that they all have mental retardation, which is the big no no word today. But that is not true today with all the early intervention and stuff like that. There are some kids with Down syndrome who are very high functioning, even go to college. 
um, so they can't all be categorized into that category of of uh, not understanding what you're talking about and uh, right and in a positive too. light. Let's go back to why we're here. Why right. we're sitting here on Zoom on a Sunday morning when yeah. um, we might not be feeling at the top of our games. Um, talking to the world about this because we want you to understand and right. and that bridge is understanding right. that that people with disabilities are as different as any of us can be and they're they're fleshed out humans with goals and aspirations and Absolutely. feelings so yeah that's why we're doing this today absolutely Let's talk about cerebral palsy it's not that we don't think you can do a web search oh and by the way when you do a web search on cerebral palsy just <laughs> learn from my experience it's sometimes hard to put a fine point on what you're looking for so i'm going to recommend going to the center for disease control or the national i get this wrong so i'm going to read it national institute of neurological disorders a lot of what you find when you first enter said the word cerebral palsy into a search engine is fluff it's not going to help you and it's going to be a distraction from finding real resources that are going to help you make the best outcomes for your loved one with cerebral palsy so that or i would recommend going right to um when you're find talking local, about a and find local organizations too I was just going to say, go right to local organizations. Yeah. Most um, states have their own absolutely um, local organizations. Absolutely, just to 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 eliminate some of those distractions uh, that from the from the real you know care and and in improving outcomes. Right. So, uh, Roberta, um, Sherry, <laughs> why don't um, you explain symptoms that teachers and young parents who have young children uh, who are born that if they notice any unusual symptoms that they may want to get checked out. Absolutely. Um, if you typically um, cerebral palsy is diagnosed at birth, but I'm thinking that maybe on the more the less involved end of the spectrum, it's going to be more difficult to to identify the symptoms right away. So I'm going to highly recommend, and this resource is going to be in the comments. In the um, descriptions, yeah. I'm so sorry. In the description, um, the um, Center for Disease Control has like a milestone marker, like your um, if your child is this age, what they should be doing. So in order to to recognize that there's a difference. Yeah, at first, you're going to get your kid out there playing with other people so that you can make a, a comparison. Mm -hmm. But then go to that Center for Disease Control um, milestone tracker and, and, and look up your child's age and what they should be doing. But things you're going to look for for um, cerebral palsy is symptoms of very, very stiff muscles. In other words, when you pick your baby up, it feels like they're pressing against you or their legs are scissoring. I'm gonna to try to make a scissor with my fingers. Their legs are scissoring. In other words, their knees are locked together and the legs are going in two different directions. Um, or your child is very, very floppy. When you pick them up, their head always goes to the same side. Um, and, and they're very delayed in picking up their head as an infant. Um, when they're, when they're, they're typically about a year old, they're getting up, they're starting to walk. If you notice a, a hemispheric, like a one-sided weakness, like they're, they're really only favoring one side when they crawl, that's something to mention to a pediatrician. And if, you're, if your pediatrician isn't, and I'm not slamming pediatricians because they see a child in a moment in time, and usually they're petrified, and they're screaming and they're not acting, they're not acting typical. So I, and this is not a criticism of pediatricians, but sometimes a pediatrician is going to refer you to a neurologic spe specialist to screen for cerebral palsy. Um, yeah, so really look for these signs and symptoms and check those milestones and the milestone tracker um, before your child is three years old and then if you find that their, their motor skills aren't, aren't keeping pace, 
um, before they're three years old, contact your, your local early intervention program. Um, if it's after, after three years old, reach out to your local school community. That, um, there, there are services available to you, but also go through your pediatrician because depending on your state, there might be in-home services available to you where you can get physical therapy and occupational therapy for your child in the home. If your child is older, again, your school community can help you find physical therapy and occupational therapy um, at, after a full evaluation. And what they're in the school setting, what they're going to be uh, evaluating is the child's ability to navigate the educational environment. Are they able to walk up and down stairs? Are they able to ambulate throughout the classroom, access? Um, access materials independently, um, manage their materials, like their coat, their backpack, their lunchbox independently. Are they independent in the lunchroom and things like that? So that's that's what, when you get to this, the level of the school age child, that's what they're gonna be assessing. It's not going to be um, so, so much the impacts at the home that they're gonna be looking at. All right, well, let's wrap it up with, um, what's it like for a child? With cerebral palsy in school? It can be tricky. It can be tricky because we, remember we talked about those uh, preconceptions when you look at somebody who has a movement disorder and they may not be able to control their their muscle movements as well. It, it's going, um, the, the perception is going to be that they're not equal or, or as intelligent um, and not so much from the adults. So the, the adults in the, in the school really um, are responsible for communicating to the, the, the peers and the other children um, about this, this uh, the child with cerebral palsy's intrinsic worth to the classroom mm -hmm. and their, their strengths and their, their abilities. Um, parents, really important to advocate for your child and not allow, the, not allow them to slip through the cracks or be... Um, I'm trying to say like low ball, like don't underestimate their abilities based on their physical appearance. Right. And parents are um, a child's then, first advocate. Parents so as long you. as the parents and the teachers and the school are working together to focus on the child's strengths, focus on their abilities, find out what their goals and aspirations are, you're going to be able to work together to have the most positive outcome possible and improve their their ability to ambulate. Um, most schools now are handicap accessible. There shouldn't be a, an issue where the, um, the physical space is not accessible for a child with a movement disability, but sometimes you, you're, you might still encounter that, but not as, as often. And that's, that's a, um, that would fall under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that would be something to remind the school that you know they need to provide accessibility, accessible um, adaptive equipment in school so that the child can access um, their desk so that they can be social. Um, a lot of the equipment involves uh, providing support for the child's trunk so that they have the stamina to participate fully in, in educational activities. Absolutely. So if you like our content, please like and share to um, our channel. Don't forget to hit the bell notification. When they say smash all the buttons. Smash yeah, smash all the buttons. Please subscribe. And if there's to our something channel. more that you want to learn about, if you want to um, open up a discussion about any any other disability, mm -hmm. what it's like for people. Um, we yeah, comment down below. Comment down below. We'd love we will. to hear from you. Yes, so we drop would. A, drop a comment. And remember, we're Bridge Builders of Diversity, building bridges for the special needs community so everybody can learn and grow together in a world of understanding for each other. That's right. That's right. All right. Appreciate y'all.